Hello everybody and welcome to Have History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and today we are going to talk about scandal, intrigue, adultery, and the salaciousness that encircled the White House during Andrew Jackson's presidency. It is more commonly known as the Petticoat Affair, but when I tell the story to people, I usually characterize it as the real housewives of the White House because of how similar the infighting was to the current shows. The story of the wives of Andrew Jackson's cabinet demonstrates many things about culture and society in antebellum America, but most importantly, it explains how stepping outside of the norms of society could topple politicians and destroy the relationships of political allies. More importantly, and argued by historian Kirsten Wood, Andrew Jackson, the first Democrat president, was a foundation of the new party, but the political party itself was still defining itself, being only a few years old. The Petticoat Affair would help outline what the Democrats and the Whigs would stand for going forward. Margaret, or Peggy O'Neill, was the beautiful daughter of one of Washington, D.C.'s most successful tavern keepers. The nation's capital was still relatively small, and congressmen and senators would frequent the tavern, where they would ultimately discuss politics and form friendships that would factor into debates on the House floor. The tavern, like most taverns, was not simply a place to drink, but acted as a hotel and restaurant. Peggy, growing up in such an environment, was quickly brought into the city's social and political circles, getting to know politicians and their families. She learned to be a great conversationalist and learned about politics from the nation's very legislators. First Lady Dolly Madison reportedly was very fond of the young woman. However, her setting concerned women within Washington society. Peggy worked as a bartender for her father in the tavern, but by the social norms of the time, that was unladylike, or at least not ladylike for someone aspiring to be respected by society. For women who did work in taverns, the stigma of promiscuity came with it, and women of the city feared their husband's loyalty being served drinks by such a beautiful young girl. Peggy herself said, while I was still in pantalettes and rolling hoops with other girls, I had the attentions of men, young and old, enough to turn a girl's head. By the time she was 16, she had attempted to elope twice, but failed in those attempts. However, she did marry one of her many pursuers. His name was John Timberlake, a man in the Navy, who had a good earning potential and was well connected in Washington society because of his family. This did not stop the ladies of Washington from still looking down on her. While her husband was out on his voyages, Peggy still worked in the bar. This behavior as a married woman caught the attention of President Monroe's wife, Elizabeth, who, while First Lady, informed Peggy that she was not invited to any more social gatherings hosted by her or other prominent women of the city. A Tennessee congressman and frequenter of the O'Neill Tavern, John Eaton, struck up a friendship with John Timberlake and Peggy. Eaton even loaned Timberlake money when he was in financial hardships, but a horrible rumor about John Eaton and Peggy having an adulterous affair spread all over Washington. Timberlake was away from home for multiple months at the time, and Peggy and John Eaton would be seen together. The rumor became more salacious when Timberlake mysteriously died at sea. Timberlake was a known alcoholic and most likely died from overdrinking, but the rumor mill in the capital alleged that Timberlake killed himself upon learning of the affair. Nevertheless, John Eaton would marry Peggy in January of 1829. Andrew Jackson had just won the presidency two months earlier and picked Eaton, his longtime friend, to be Secretary of War. This appalled the women of Washington even more to imagine a woman with Peggy's reputation as a cabinet wife and vowed never to socialize with her. The female socialists hurled derogatory statements about her through social circles like adulterer. This ruffled feathers of the president, whose own wife got labeled with the same epitaph after she married Jackson when she had not yet received her divorce from her estranged husband. Those insults were hurled at both Jackson and Rachel during the presidential campaign, and it was those attacks that Jackson blamed for her untimely death soon after her husband had won the election. Needless to say, Andrew Jackson had a soft spot for women who were insulted in such ways, and he insisted on bringing Peggy and John into the social circles of Washington despite the opinions of Washingtonians. Historian Kirsten Wood explains well the relationship between politics and society in Washington when she states, Politic and government and social life were closely connected in the capital, 
and not just during the Eaton Affair. Before well-organized mass parties came to dominate the American political landscape, office holders and office seekers relied heavily on sociability and personal friendship to win and keep the support of colleagues and the voters. Washington gatherings such as dinner parties and balls were occasions not simply to meet with friends but also to make political contacts. Exclusion from this social intercourse was generally interpreted as a sign of both personal and political hostility. This is precisely what made the Petticoat War into an internal crisis for the reigning party. Therefore, being social and attending parties hinged on the stability of the party. That makes it even more significant when the other cabinet women and Florid Calhoun, the wife of Vice President John C. Calhoun, all shunned Peggy by not inviting the couple to parties or dinners and not responding to the Eaton's invitations to their parties that they threw. The Democratic Party was attacking itself by attacking John and Peggy, but so were the opposition party who labeled the party sinful because of Jackson and Peggy's actions, both being adulterers. The common belief that corrupt people would infect society and disrupt the social order made many people fear putting people like Jackson in political office, and that is what the Whig Party capitalized on when running against Democrats in congressional elections. In moral terms, all the women involved had a reason to act as part of a popular movement, to stamp out vice. The ladies wanted to exclude Margaret Eaton entirely from the society because they believed that even the slightest contact with a sinful woman would irreparably harm their reputations. Further, they worried that others might be drawn to the admittedly attractive and amusing woman if the social ban were relaxed. Finally, they found strength in numbers by presenting their behavior as compliant with the judgment of their female peers. Individuals shielded themselves from accusations that they were being idiosyncratic or unfair. Because it was believed that women contained the morality of society, the group of women banding together would only strengthen the idea that there was something immoral about Peggy and that it threatened American society. Indeed, women were uncontrollable and omnipotent in matters of social intercourse, as John C. Calhoun argued, that the moral issues identified by his wife and other women were paramount to all political considerations, and he was prepared to meet the consequences, be they what they might. This petticoat affair was ripping the Democrat Party apart from the inside, as men and women within the cabinet took sides either for or against the Eatons. By 1831, the crisis came to a head when information came out that Vice President Calhoun, years earlier, had attempted to censure Jackson for his 1819 invasion of Spanish Florida. Additionally, Jackson's cabinet resigned, some begrudgingly, but the petticoat affair had made it appear as though the squabbles within the White House was preventing actual work from being done. Those who resigned included John Eaton. John would die in 1856. Peggy would remarry in 1859 to an Italian music teacher. He was in his mid-twenties and she was 59. After only seven years of marriage, her husband would run away to Italy with her fortune and her 17-year-old granddaughter. Peggy would die in poverty in Washington, D.C. in 1879. Thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed this little history lesson about how a squabble about social norms and women's behavior threaten a political party's existence. If you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and don't forget to check out the Patreon page. Thank you all, and have a great day.